Hello, my dear chess friends. It's good to be back, and I have returned with a couple of ideas for anti London. So, those of you that are playing with blacks and they find it kind of challenging to play against the London system, here it is. I will present to you guys a few ideas for you to just uh, keep them in mind, try to apply them, see what happens in your own practical games. Okay, so I have here prepared a game in between two powerful Bulgarian grandmasters. We've got with white, I hope I pronounced this correctly, Vladimir Petkov, and with black, Nikolov Momchil. So apologies if I didn't get the right pronunciation. Okay, so we are going to look from black's perspective um, how they played a very creative game, and at some point it makes a lot of sense, and I think it's totally worth understanding it. So, there we go, d4, knight f6, so nothing funky about this uh, moment, bishop f4, so white already commits in the London system, they already commit the bishop quickly getting out, so just for those of you that probably, maybe if they've forgotten, is just the whole idea that you want to play e3, so the bishop is no longer blocked, okay, so you get an active bishop, uh, along the g8 g uh, g3 b8 diagonal and it's no longer blocked by the e3 so that's why it's being played uh, on the second move we're playing now d5 e3 okay uh and c5 so that's one way for black uh my chess friends one way for black to try and challenge the d4 pawn now just to keep in mind if white were to take on c5 what we want to do with black is just play knight c6 because the intention is just to push the e5 and get the center for black. Now, if they were to happen with knight f3, you could also do a pin so that you can further keep in mind to playing the e5. So just as an idea, just as an idea, in case white were to take knight c6, which by the way, you'll be playing knight c6 regardless if white takes or not, because you kind of get to develop your pieces. You must develop your pieces. <clears throat> incredibly important so knight b1 to d2 bishop f5 kind of similarly mirroring white's intention you want to play this bishop now and exactly the same thing uh you are controlling now the g6 b1 diagonal so white can't go with the queen c2 and they got to be very careful not getting the rook on b1 the same goes for black they must be careful about not playing rook on b8 okay so knight f3 being developed queen 2 b6 so as we can see now, the weakness for white after they committed the bishop, after they developed the bishop on f4, is the b2 pawn, which will be very likely attacked by queen b7. Uh, sorry, queen b6, which is uh, uh, exactly the thing that happened in our game. The same goes for black. The weakness is uh, the pawn on b7. So probably white, if they wanted to attack b7, they could have done it before playing the knight on f3. Okay, but now black moves first with queen to b6 so just keep in mind that's a very desirable square for the black queen to be now <clears throat> because of this particular bishop uh obviously it's impossible for white to try and move the queen or the rook because it's super dangerous obviously it's an absolute blunder so the very normal move is queen b3 okay so you're just staring down at the other queen okay so were they challenging one another and I don't think any particular color here wants to necessarily trade the other guy's queen because you practically open up the rook's column. So if black were to take, if black were to take, white would capture probably with A and rook would be very active. And yeah, it's what it is. So you don't want to activate their pieces. And what does black play here is taking space and kind of forcing the queen to trade, okay? I mean, there is no point for the white queen to go back on d1, right? Uh, you're going to lose on b2. That's a disaster. What's the whole point of it? So it kind of forces the white queen to trade. And if you tell me, oh, hey, wait a second, I may just move the queen on a3. I don't have to trade. Well, queen a3 is actually quite bad because... After queen a3, there is this super insidious move, very aggressive, e5 move that black can play immediately. And, uh, I'm good. okay, let me just do this. So queen a3. And now you're just simply going to go with the 
E5 right in the center. It's a little bit of, uh, it's a very, very dangerous discovered attack directly on the queen. Um, even if they might be thinking that you're attacking in the center, obviously the bishop should be quite visible, I guess, for any intermediate advanced player that we got an issue here. So there is a problem now for white, really, and I don't think there is any good move here. So white queen is kind of forced at this stage to trade and to uh, take on b6. Now black takes. So this is what we're having at the moment in the London system. That's the position, move number eight. That's what we got here. Right, so we're going now. A3. Uh, A3 because naturally now you think... Um, just they don't want to just keep the rook there looking after a pawn. So they play d3 exactly to just prevent this and to be able to move the rook, you know, to c1, to d1, to just move the rook freely without having to worry about defending a2 pawn. b5, rook c1, h6 being played. Let's just discuss a little bit the h6. h6 for black, my chess friends, is defensive. It's a, it's a very smart move and practical one well of course we all know the h6 is generally aimed at stopping knight or bishop to come on g5 we know that and perhaps at some point some g5 maybe perhaps okay but in our position here the bishop, if it were to be attacked by knight h4, very nicely retreats on h7 and preserves itself all this beautiful, cruising, super dangerous diagonal h7 to b1. And white needs to be very careful because this move c4 also took from white the d3 square. So the bishop can't get there. Okay, so, you know, that's a problem. Okay, uh, so h6 again. After knight were to play on h4, very nicely you go on h7 with that particular bishop. So h3 in the same spirit, the other GM in the same spirit, they played h3. Okay, if it were to happen for knight to attacking the bishop on f4, they just drop the bishop nicely back on h2. So only to e6, only to e6, so that you need to kind of think about uh, getting your pieces in the game but you will be probably surprised by how things will be evolving very very soon just bear with me a second guys so bishop e2 you would say very natural stuff right so you got to get the things out in the game <coughs> now black played a move uh my chess friends they played knight f6 over to d7 and you may ask yourselves, why would I leave the f6 square? Why wouldn't I focus myself on attacking on the king side? What do I want to do with the knight on d7? And practically, if we have established that the weakness is on b2 for white, um, probably we should be able then to envisage a very nice itinerary for the black knight from f6, goes to d7, and then we take it one step further, to b6 and then another step to a4 and bingo voila the revelation we will be attacking the b2 which mind you guys can't be defended by the rook because the bishop is here okay the bishop which is kind of like super dangerous here for white so this idea for black uh, my friends is to be used in your future games so you never know just keep this setup in mind keep these ideas in mind okay so that that might but that might give you some some good play in some of your games against the london system okay let's going forwards now g4 so now white tries to create some counter attack on the king side with g4 attacking the bishop obviously Bishop h7, as we've discussed. Bishop now to d1, and you may wonder why. Well, this guy on, on h7 is such a dangerous bishop that white would be so super happy to exchange them, to trade them off. So keep in mind, guys, if there is a super active piece, you want to uh, trade that piece. You want to exchange them, to take them off the board because it's way too dangerous. And for white now, the bishop on h7, it's a real, real uh, troublemaker. So knight b6, we 
you know, we stick to our plan. Bishop on c2 now. And unfortunately now for the black bishop on h7, the light square uh, black bishop, you can't uh, refuse the exchange here. Uh, there is no point. It's, it's madness to get the bishop on g8. It's just absolutely, you can't do that. So unfortunately, even if it pains you at some point, trading is the only way. So you've got to take. And now rook takes. And now, you know, you might be you might be inclined to appreciate, well, now my whole plan goes out the window now because even if I'm, even if I'm doing now knight a5, Sorry, even if I do knight a4, uh, the b2 is already defended, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna get to that weakness. But actually, uh, black played absolutely magnificent, and they did find uh, an incredible way to pursue precisely that weakness. And guys, you're gonna see it because now it's getting revealed. So before playing the knight. They sacrificed the pawn onto b4. And now you're going to tell me, what on earth is that? It's just two pawns guarding over there. This just doesn't make any sense. But um, if we deepen it, if we deepen the position, we just recognize that after, let's just say that the a pawn were to take, guys, we've got the incredible rook, the, the, the fabulous rook that will check the king. That's just a devastating skewer here. Uh, there is no way for white to block the check. The king must come to the second rank and then the rook just takes the other rook. It's devastating. And even if they were to take with the C pawn, let's just put it this way, the C pawn takes, knight takes, okay. And again, if the pawn takes, we've got the same issue. We've got the same skewer and uh, they got a massive problem about losing material. So this sort of move is just so creative. So white didn't even bother. So they castled immediately because you simply couldn't have taken the pawn on b4. <coughs> what do you think black plays? They push on b3. And now you tell me, wait a second, why would you why would you close it now? Because it got so interesting to that point. Now you just close the attack. No, the attack is not closed, it's just getting better and better, believe it or not. So rook obviously now has to move. Knight to a4. And now you probably you probably already got an idea about what is Black's intention. This is particularly at this point in the game, particularly at, at this point. There might be some situations, my chess friends, where sacrificing a minor piece for two pawns is more, more than recommended, and the compensation is huge. Okay, so probably, probably, uh, you know, if you want to pause it, pause now and look at the position and then uh, come back with the idea of what black should be playing next because it's just beautiful. And uh, black sacrifices this idle bishop on f8, sacrifices himself on a3. But actually, it's enormous compensation, very good compensation that actually wins the game because not just the commentators, but the engine itself agrees that black is absolutely winning at this stage in the game here. After pawn takes the bishop, boom, we're starting eating away from the pawn structure. And this is incredibly dangerous. Two past connected pawns, this is a nightmare. And... I don't think there is any good play here for white to prevent those pawns from advancing. Now, they did try though. Uh, white tried here with rook to b2. Look at this check. Look at this check. The e2 is absolutely, is absolutely super, super dangerous. So knight checked. King had to move. Got rid of that super active bishop. So they have eliminated the bishop that was what was actually quite paralyzing the dark squares. So now you got no issue with that uh, with that bishop. Rook took on a3. The other rook tries tries to you know I mean they just try to uh, stopping any possible pawns advancement, right? But now black starts to march for victory. Uh, if white rook were to take pawn were to take it back and even if you play the rook on a1 knight then goes to b4 white king uh, sorry the black king will be castled or i don't know moving e or d getting the rook in the game and it's totally totally winning for black in this position if they were to take the rook and for this particular reason white didn't take 
So they had refused the trade because it can't work out for white here. Okay, so the other night now, which was a little bit idle, comes a little bit into force. More support for those two pawns. Uh, they try to get a little bit of game. Uh, GM Petkov tried to get a little bit of the, uh, you know, some counterattack with the knight. But it's not going to work out very well. So they try to open up here, try to attack. Maybe this weakness, he was hoping maybe to open up a bit. Castle now for black. Knight comes into play, the knight on f3, on e5. So black now pushes the b5 over to b4. And look how menacing, look look, look how threatening those, those pawns are. I mean, it's just unbelievable. Those pawns are very, very, very strong. So now we start to attack. The c1 rook needs to go away. And this looks incredibly scary. So it's very very unstoppable here and it's a major headache so rook now plays over to c8 uh, knight to b6 trying to attack the rook rook goes on c6 attacking now white tries to generate some complications here but to no avail uh, black played a perfect move takes on b6 knight takes and these three pawns with the rook on a7 uh, with the rook on a2 and knight on a5 are more than enough uh, to win and this pawn is pretty much now unstoppable as the other guy so it's just getting way too much and after knight b3 white had resigned it was just too much for them to cope with uh this knight coming on d2 uh Pawn capturing if the rook doesn't move or just simply move forwards and gets a queen is just too much for white to cope with. So from this point of view, they just simply resign at this point. And uh, that was it. A beautiful game played by Black, Nikolov Mamchil against Vladimir Petkov. A beautiful anti-London ideas, guys. So when you're playing this, uh, you know, versus white, keep in mind this game. You know, uh, it's totally, totally worth it. It's just splendid. And uh, yeah, don't forget about the C5. So don't forget the C5. You want to challenge on D4. So that that that's an idea for you guys to keep in mind. Uh, keep developing. Very important. Yes, that's another very good idea. Go with your bishop on F5. And provided white doesn't play it first, you may go with your queen on b6 attacking the pawn on b2 which is the weakness so try and keep in mind these ideas guys and see if they serve you well in your games and you know drop me a few messages tell me your experience and uh, not to forget i think i've uh, replied to a friend of ours and i said i'll be presenting some demo games in the Dragodorf. I will be doing that, guys. Now I just wanted to um, I just wanted to discuss this anti-London ideas uh, in between. So have a great day, my friends, and um, I'll see you soon.